chapter number four. Chapter number four is where we are tonight. We will cover part of this chapter tonight and leave the rest for next week unless the Lord says so. Amen. Uh, I want each of you to look at Acts chapter eight verses 26 through 40. Acts chapter eight verses 26 through 40. And then uh, brother Whitlock, would you get Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 through 46. Acts chapter eight, 26 through 40 is where we will we will land tonight and we will support it with Isaiah 3 and Matthew 26 verses 36 through 46. Amen. Hallelujah. Our topic for chapter 4 is picturize. There are five P's to effective evangelism and they are pinpoint Lord have mercy. Jesus, 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 Jesus. There are five P's to effective evangelism, and they are prepare, pinpoint, picturize, personalize, and y'all y'all still got them back. Prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. Amen. There are five P's to effective evangelism, and they are prepare. Pinpoint, personalized, 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 prescribed. And prescribed. Amen. 
And all of our lessons are coming from a medical standpoint, from a medical background, from a medical background, from a medical background, amen? Coming from a medical background. And therefore, therefore we are looking, we're looking at the salvation story from a medical standpoint. We are looking at the salvation story from a medical standpoint. Amen. Stay right where you are, sister. Don't move anything now. Don't move. Don't move anything. Amen. So we are looking at picturize. 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 Amen. Picturize. When we look at Acts chapter 8, it will give us a pure picture of, of soul winning, of what soul winning is all about. Amen. Acts chapter 8. When we look at the book of Acts, we see in Acts chapter 1. Jesus says that you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. He didn't say you will receive power. After you receive power, then you will shout. He didn't say that after you receive power, you will speak in other tongues. He didn't say after you receive power, you will dance Roll on the floor a foam from your mouth. Jesus says that after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses. You shall be witnesses unto me. Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20, that you will receive power after this power has come upon you, you will make disciples. He says, go and make disciples. We ought to be concerned about making disciples. We ought to be concerned about winning souls for Jesus Christ. The church is not a club. It's not a, an organization. The church is an organism. The church is a breathing body, a living organism that praises and honors God. Therefore, we are to win souls for Christ. Prepare is the most important part of this soul winning experience. We must spend 90% of our time in preparation and 10% of our time actually sharing the gospel. Amen? Amen. Yes, we ought to spend 90% of our time preparing to share the gospel. And the other 10% of our time ought to be spent in actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must be intentional. We must look for opportunities. We want, must pray for opportunities. We must ask God to deliver us into opportunities. And as we walk with God, we walk with him in such a way that we want to make sure that we can hear him when he speaks. Have you ever heard God speaking to you? Ever? Ever? Have you ever thought God spoke to you? Have you ever appreciated God speaking to you? Yes, yes. God speaks to us by way of his word. He speaks to us by way of his Holy Spirit. He speaks to us on a regular basis. He's trying to get our attention. As some of you have already passed through uh, uh, Kings, you've passed through the book of Kings and you're listening, you realize that the prophet Elijah, Elijah, why do I emphasize Elijah? Because there's an Elisha, right? So when you see the prophet Elijah, he is dealing with this awful queen whose name is Jezebel. Why is she so awful? She just the way she is. The little boy said, it is what it is. She, she is, she is, she is a horrible queen. She is married to the king, and the king's name is Ahab, right? 
So the king, Nangans Ahab, he could have been a pretty good old boy, but he was married to Jezebel. Why don't women these days, Brother Whitlock, uh, name their children Jezebel? Hmm? Because she's bad. She's bad. She's ungodly, right? Now, there are some children who grew up with their name Jezebel. In the 20th century, there are some people who actually name their children Jezebel. Matter of fact, there's a Jezebel kitchen that I avoid. <laughs> I mean, why would you go that route? Brother Miles, you been by that kitchen? I have not. You heard about the kitchen? Oh, <laughs> so Davis, you paid some money to the kitchen? Mm. It's actually, am I lying, Brother Mouth? It's true. It is true. It's, what is it? Don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> so when we deal with Ahab and, and when we deal with Jezebel, Elijah had told Ahab already, there will not be dew nor rain until I say so. But three and a half years, there was no dew and no rain until the preacher said so. He troubled Israel. He troubled Israel because the king wanted rain. Jezebel wanted rain. And this preacher comes along and tells him there will be no rain. So he says, I tell you what, if your God is a God that he says he is, y'all meet me up on Mount Carmel. 850 prophets, false prophets, met him on Mount Carmel. 400 from one group, 450 from another group, 850 met him on Mount Carmel. He gave them the first choice to make sure that they understood that their God was the great God. I'm talking about God speaking to us, right? I'm getting there. He says, I tell you what, those of you who worship Baal, go ahead first and call on your God and the God that answers by fire. That's the God that's the true and the living God. What he was really saying, if your God is dead, try mine. So they called from morning to noonday and Baal didn't answer. So the preacher, Elijah, started taunting them. He says, he says, why don't you call him a little louder because he may be on his journey. Then he said, why don't you call him again because he may be relieving himself. <laughs> did, you get, did you get that out of the scripture? He says, why don't you call him because he may be taking a nap. What Elijah was doing was pointing out the fact that we have a God that's everywhere at the same time. We have a God who is almighty and all powerful. And we have a God that never sleeps nor slumbers. He is the great God, the king. He is God. So after he called up on, on they, he called him up on Mount Carmel, and their God didn't answer, they began to cut themselves and gash themselves up with stones. Then Elijah turned came on Mount Carmel. He said, I tell you what you do. You, you, you pour water on the boat. You pour water on the altar. You dig a trench and you fill that trench up with water. And the Bible says, when Elijah called on God, fire came from heaven, burned up the bullet, burned up the altar, and licked the water out of the trenches. It's because we serve a living God. After that happened, Elijah had all of these false prophets killed. Now Jezebel is real mad. I mean, she is fighting mad. She's killing mad. She promised him by in the morning you'd be dead. So Elijah runs into a cave. And every now and then the preacher gets scared. But if I don't run, you don't run. Elijah runs away. Because Jezebel is a hard taskmaster. Jezebel is a bad actor. Runs into the cave. Lightning came, God went in the lightning. Storm came, God went in the storm. Noise came, God went in the noise. Earthquake came, God went in the earthquake. But God was in.
still small voice. When God speaks, it's not so much of a drastic thing all the time. God can talk any way he wants to talk. He can speak any way he wants to speak. But in this particular instance, God was in a still, small voice. Not in the noise of the earthquake, not in the, the blazing fire. He was in a still, small voice. I just want to tell you, sometimes you have to listen for God. Sometimes you have to be attentive to God. Sometimes you have to be quiet before God. God is even speaking tonight. He's speaking somewhere other than in church tonight. God is trying to get somebody's attention tonight. When we look at Acts chapter 5, I mean Acts chapter 8 rather, when we look at Acts chapter 8, we find the Holy Spirit has come. We, we find that uh, Peter been locked up. We find that the, the first seven deacons have been chosen. And the Bible is very clear the purpose of the deacons were the purpose of the deacon was to work, to serve. Diakone. Diakone, this word means that you are a servant. It didn't say the deacon's purpose was to keep the pastor in line. It says. In, in chapter chapter 7, he says that we need you to look out among yourselves and find seven men full of the Holy Ghost who's on fire for the Lord, who's amply teach that we can put over this business. Some honest men. Men with good reputations. We want to put these men over this business. What was the business? Yes. Serving the people, the widows. Serving the people. Why was there a need to call these deacons to serve? That's, that's the right answer. What's the biblical answer? Why was there a need to call seven men to put them over this business? What was this business? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. I'm trying to rest with your head, Father. Excuse me. I believe your question was, uh, would you ask the question again? Why, why was there a need to have deacons? Uh, that was to take some of the workforce off the... Uh, Say the, uh, the, the apostles at that time, the preachers at that time. Uh, there was a few going on between uh, the Greeks and the Christians, but the, the deacons basically were to take care of the works of the church okay. so that the preachers can take care of the spiritual call of the church. Amen. So so there was there was a dispute, right? The Hellenistic or the Grecian women were being felt like they were being overlooked. So the preachers didn't want to leave the gospel and teaching and preaching the gospel in order to address all these issues. So he said, look among yourselves and find seven men with the Holy Spirit who are honest, who have a good reputation and place them over this business of putting the fire out. I wish I could tell deacons all over the world, it's your job to put the fire out. It's not your job to start the fire. It's your job to put the fire out. To sell the arguments. To stop people from complaining. Too many deacons pass on the complaining. Get involved in the fire. Too many deacons set the fire. Yeah. Too many members set the fire. So when we move from chapter 6 of Acts to chapter 7 of Acts, we have Stephen there, and he is preaching Jesus. Remember, they told him to shut up in chapter 5. Gamaliel stands up in chapter 5. Gamaliel says, you can't stop it if it's of God. He said, leave these men alone. If it's of God, you can't stop it. If it's not of God, it's going to come to naught. So you got the deacons in, in chapter 6. Then Stephen, one of the first deacons, is preaching Jesus or teaching Jesus. He stands up and he tells them about Jesus and they stone him to death. And when you move to chapter 8, the Bible begins in chapter 8 of Acts. And the Bible says that Saul was there and he was in cahoots with them because it was evidence that because he held the men coats 
that stoned Stephen to death. He was holding their coats. He was complicit. He was right along with them. He was guilty. He was a murderer too. We all tell our children and we all been told as children, don't ride in the car with some people because if you get pulled over, don't hang around certain children because if you get pulled over, you're going down with them. Saul was complicit. Saul was going down as a murderer also. Move to Acts right around verses 26 through 40. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Let's look at that. You have the second deacon that comes on the scene that the Bible highlights. It's Philip. Stephen is dead. Stephen was a man that loved the Lord. He was, he was Holy Ghost filled. He was saved, sanctified, and woo, filled with his precious Holy Ghost. But he died. Sometimes you can die for the wrong reason. Sometimes you can witness for God and still lose your life. Isn't that something? Stephen dies, and in the midst of Stephen dies, he looks up toward heaven, and what does he see? Jesus, before he took his last breath, he sees Jesus standing up on the right hand of the Father. Now, we know Jesus to be one who's sitting on the right hand. He's sitting on the right hand of God, making intercession for us. When we confess our sin, Jesus passes it on to God and says, God, forgive us. That's why we pray to Jesus. So, here Philip is in Acts chapter 8. Philip is on the scene. When you look at verse number 26 of Acts chapter 8, he says, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. I told you, God speaks, right? Yeah. So when God speaks, we all obey. The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which is down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. Boy, God would have lost a lot of us. First of all, we wouldn't have heard from him. <laughs> Secondly, we wouldn't have obeyed him. Thirdly, he says, go south instead of going north. And he says, which is go, which goes down from Jerusalem. We want to stop in Jerusalem, down to Gaza. And then God says, the angel speaks and he says for God, this is desert. <laughs> it's desert. It's, it's not pleasant. It says to us today that we need to understand that soul winning is not something that's going to be pretty all the time. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be something that people open arms and, and just greet us and welcome us in. But God has a way of setting us up, doesn't he? God has a way of speaking to the person that's going to be won and to the person who's doing the witness. He says, go, go to the desert. So he arose and went. Look how he obeys. He arose. Verse 26 says, Arise, and guess what he did? He arose. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch. What's a eunuch? I know we in church. One who does not have the ability to reproduce. One who does not have the ability to reproduce. Paul said there were some that were born a eunuch, and then there are some who were made a eunuch. And in the Bible, they made men eunuchs when they were around the king's girls or the king's wives or they were around certain women in high statue. So he says, he says this, this man was a eunuch. He had great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He had great stature. He had great authority. Let me tell you, just because people have great authority doesn't mean they're saved. Just because people have a title in church doesn't mean they are saved. He had great authority. He worked directly under the king. Matter of fact, it goes on to talk about that he held the king's, the queen's money. 
the queen. He handled the queen money. You know he had authority. He was trustworthy. He handled the treasury. And had come to Jerusalem to worship. Says to us also, everybody who's in worship don't have worship in them. Let me say that right. <laughs> Everyone who's in worship does not have worship in them. Just because people show up at the church doesn't mean that they're saved. Matter of fact, the church is a hospital by which we ought to become saved. And after we are saved, we ought to be renewed day by day. So he comes down. He, he's coming to Jerusalem to worship. And now he's returning and sitting in the chariot. And he is reading Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 53. You can read it in your, your, your free time. After you get through listening. Then the spirit says to Philip. Go near. And overtake the chariot. The spirit of God says to Philip. Now Philip you go near. Look how Philip just obeyed the orders. It doesn't. The Bible doesn't record. When he rationalized it. Or he debated. We debate God. We're smart God. We, we know what we're doing. So he's debating. He doesn't debate. We debate God. He goes in and he overtakes the chariot. The ver verse number 30 says, this is Acts chapter 8, verse 30 says, so Philip did what? Ran, Ran to him. Mm -hmm. Not only did he, did he obey him, he got in a hurry to obey him. Mm -hmm. In the David's household, you had to obey right now. Mm -hmm. You had to get in a hurry to do it. We didn't drag our feet, walk from one room to the other. We didn't hold our head down. Mama called, daddy called. Today, I'm still running. So, so Philip ran. We ought to get in a hurry to win souls for Christ. Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? Remember last week we talked about personal lives? The week before last we talked about personal lives. You have to get on that person's level. Meet them where they are. Make sure that you don't crowd them with catchy phrases. Make sure you don't be preaching to them. Make sure you stay on their level. So, And then another thing I said to you is always listen. You listen to God and you listen to the, the patient also. Whatever you do, pay attention. So he asked him, what are, you, what are you reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? How can I understand? How can I, unless someone guides me, unless someone teaches me or someone leads me, how can I understand unless somebody leads me? And he answered Philip, to, he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. You do know that God put this together, don't you? You do realize that God put things together. He, he already knows everything that's going to happen. He knew that the eunuch was going to be where he was. He already prepared the way for Philip. And Philip ran and made it happen. Let me tell you, sometimes we can abort God's plan if we don't get in a hurry. Get it done. We just have to make sure we hear from God. How many of y'all have been in some of those uh, yeah. prophesying services mm. Mm. where whatever was prophesied 10 years ago still hadn't happened? They go from prophesying to prophesying. <laughs> so we need to make sure we're hearing from God. Every man of God doesn't have a word for you. People, I don't know if they do it now, but people used to pack coliseums because they would come on the radio and say, this bishop, this apostle, this prophet is walking the floor like never before. And that's all some people need to hear. They would pay big bucks to get into the coliseum because he's walking the floor like never before. God uses ordinary men. God uses ordinary children. God uses ordinary women. God blesses us through people. 
But God does not fight against what's in his word. It will always line up with what's in God's word. So the scripture that he read from, he said, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Who do you think he's talking about? Who is Isaiah talking about? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. But now this is Old Testament, so how, why do you say he's talking about Jesus? This is Old Testament. Jesus hadn't come on the scene yet. He's quoting from Isaiah, the Old Testament. So why y'all say he's talking about Jesus? Tell me. It's a prophecy. Oh, it's a prophecy. Is it a true prophecy? Yes. Is Isaiah a true prophet? Yes. How do you know who's a true prophet? The words he speaks come true. When he speaks, it comes to the path. It becomes true. So Isaiah is speaking prophecy. He said, there will be one that will come that will be dumb before sure. Dumb meaning he didn't open his mouth. It doesn't mean that Jesus is dumb as we think in the 21st century. It's where dumb means that he's speechless. He didn't talk. He chose not to speak. He chose not to fight against them verbally. He was dumb before his sure. Compares him to a sheep, right? Mm -hmm. Compares him to a lamb. Lamb goes right in there, get his hair cut, go to the next station, get his, cut, his throat cut, and never says a mother's word. That's why the preacher said, the Lamb of God, who never said a mother's word. So the unit, verse number 34, so the unit answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? And of himself or some other man? So he's asking, is Isaiah talking about himself? Or is Isaiah talking about somebody else? He, he calls him a prophet, right? So is Isaiah talking about somebody else? Or is Isaiah talking about some other man. Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Brother Miles must be a prophet. Brother Miles said he was talking about Jesus. How did you know that, Brother Miles? Old Testament, right? It's prophecy, right? The Old Testament leads up to Jesus. The New Testament leads away from Jesus. And the whole Bible is all about Jesus. Every book Every verse points right back to the Savior of the world. Every last one of them. Have you seen Jesus in Lamentation? Have you seen Jesus in Deuteronomy? Have you seen Jesus in Genesis? How I many of you use the phrase, God always has a ram in the bush? Why y'all say that? Why do people say that? God always have a ram in the bush. Why do we say that? Anybody in this room used that before? Because God had a ram in the bush for Abraham. Mm -hmm. He took his son up to sacrifice him. Abraham took Isaac up, laid him on the altar, getting ready to take his life, drew the knife back, and, and the angel said, don't kill him. Don't stab him. Don't cut him. Look over here and you will see a ram stuck in the stickets. Stuck in the bush. God had a ram in the bush so he didn't have to kill his son. He killed the ram. Are you with me? God is speaking. God is, 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 is available to us. We got to be listening. That's the thing about fasting. When you fast, you are clearing the airways for God. Every time your stomach growls, it calls your attention to call on God. Every time 
pressure hits. Every time something comes upon you that you don't like in the middle of your fast, every time the devil tries to tempt you, you call on God. Fasting allows you to hear from God clearly. Somebody said, I'm here for these pains that's hurting me. But the pain ought to remind you to call on God. Verse 35. Now, if you have the NIV and some other, some other, I think it's NIV and ESV, one of these verses is going to be missing. Okay? I'm reading from the New King James. 36, verse 36, Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He's ready. Look at the order. Look at the order. Look at how, how the order, look, God sets it up well. He hears about Jesus. He believes in Jesus. He reads about Jesus. And then he's baptized. 98, I, I, this, is, this, is my, this is my logic. No one told me this. This is no, no data that I've read. I believe that 98% of the people who are now saved receive their salvation after baptism. I receive my salvation after baptism. I sat on the mourner's bench. Anybody know what the mourner's bench is? And you can't say bench, you have to say bench. The mourner's bench. They would have a revival in the month of August and then, then they'll have another one in the springtime. And the saints of God will be in the room and they will be praying for the people sitting up front on the mourner's bench. Those children, usually little children, are sitting there until they feel something. Or until they feel like God is functioning them. And they get up and give the preacher their hand and give God their heart. I remember at the age of 10, Pastor Simpson, Sim, Pastor Simmons from Chicago, Illinois, was preaching revival at St. James Missionary Baptist Church, three and a half miles outside of Indianola, between Indianola and Inverness on Highway 49. At 10 years old, I got up out on that Tuesday night. That was my night. And I gave him my hand and gave God what I thought I was doing, was giving God my heart. I got baptized that, that, that next Sunday along with some other people. But I did not know Jesus. It was actually eight years later, later in Miss Bonner's sixth period class. What room, Sister Whitlock? Cross from the cafeteria. From the cafeteria. <laughs> room number two. At Gentry High School, Indianola, Mississippi. About 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Dorothy Steele said to me, you don't have to keep living the way you're living. You can be born again right here, right now in this room. Birds don't have to sing. Birds don't have to fly. The earth doesn't have to open up. The earth doesn't have to quake. The sky doesn't have to open up. But you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life. Do you believe? That Jesus died for your sin, was buried in a barber tomb, and rose from the dead. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior that day. This unit did it in the right order. That's why at the New Beginning Church, we want to make sure that children know Jesus before we take him to the water. Back home, they would say it like this. He went in as a dry devil and came out as a wet devil. And they base that on your attitude and, and how you treated people after baptism. So he says, what hinders me? There's water. What hinders me? He preached Jesus to him. There's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Verse number 37. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. You may what? You may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you're reading from ESV or NIV, you don't have that verse, verse 37. Some believe that that verse was omitted in the original translations. Others believe that that verse was taken out of the original translation. New King James says, 
that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you shall be saved. Verse 37. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the unit went down into the water, and he was baptized. He was baptized. So it's our responsibility to reach people for Christ. It's our responsibility to, to go forward and, and introduce people to Jesus Christ. It is our responsibility to hear from God and let God show us. And then when we look at chapter 4 and picture rise, it's our responsibility to paint the picture of both heaven and hell. You do know that hell is real, right? You do know that hell was made for somebody. But so was heaven. The soul winner must paint a description of hope in the mind of the patient. There's a portrait that's painted with a woman sitting on top of the world. This woman that's sitting on top of the world, her clothes are tattered. Her hair is blowing in the wind. She has scars all over her face. And the author, the, the painter says that she is a portrait of hope. And she's playing on a violin or a guitar. And she only has one string left. But the painter declares she's a portrait of hope. Says us when there is no hope, we ought to find some hope. And our hope is in Jesus. So we ought to paint a picture of hope to every patient. The soul winner is a therapist who advises the patient of his or her condition and encourages him or her doing, uh, doing rehabilitation, monitors the patient's progress, and assists the patient in following the great physician's order to, orders to complete the restoration and the recovery process. We're soul winners. We got to walk them through this thing. Look at Philip. Philip walks him through the plan of salvation. He deals with the plan of salvation. He doesn't move over from the plan of salvation. A couple of Saturdays ago, I went to a funeral downtown Houston, and, and there were cars bumper to bumper on this one street. So I had to go to, to the nearest, it was a, a storage area, like a storage where they store stuff. You know how you pull the door down and they store stuff. So I had, I, I looked over there, I said, I wonder why people are not parking here. Well, it's a, it's a private parking lot. And I always have a person to tell me, well, you know, you better not do that. <laughs> but I had the nerve, the audacity to go, to go ask the lady, ma'am, do you mind if I park here? I'm going to the church over here about three blocks down, and there's nowhere to park. You mind if I park here? She said, oh, no, I don't mind. God prepared the moment. And I knew it was a safe place because she's sitting there looking at a, a full glass window. Not only did God give me a parking place, he gave me a safe parking place and he gave me a security guard to watch over. <laughs> look at God. Look at, look at what God would do. He gave me a security guard to watch over. So when I returned, my car was just fine. Wasn't nothing missing and, and, and wasn't, nothing, wasn't any damage. Matter of fact, no one parked within three parking spots of me. No scratches, no extra extra paint jobs on it. You know how you can go to some parking lot, your, your car is black, you can come out with white paint on it. No extra paint on it. So I walked in and I said, thank you. And I gave her a tip. And then as I walked out the door, I thought, on the back of my business card is the plan of salvation. So I walked back in the door. I wasn't unction to lead her to Christ, but I was unction to call her attention to what's on the back of the car. The Roman road is back there. And the Roman road says to us, the Roman road says that, that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Roman road says that the, the sin has a payday. The wages of sin is death. The Roman road says if you believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, you will be saved. The Roman road says that if you call upon the name of Jesus, he that calls upon him will be born again. Every opportunity is an opportunity. Every moment is an opportunity. So we are to guide people and show them 
paint pictures for them of this glorious place called heaven. Create mental pictures for your patient. Create mental pictures for your patient. Create mental pictures. Paint pictures for them. Paint real pictures of life after death. Paint a real picture of life after death. Paint real pictures of life after death. Heaven and hell. There's a heaven you can go to and there's a hell you can go to. That choice is yours. And you don't need to be that mean about it. Every time, every time the preacher opens the doors of the church and then when he gets through, he says, it's ours to offer and yours to accept or, or reject. I cringe. Because remember, in personal life, we want to always be kind enough to make things attractive enough for people to get to know Jesus. When you look at Philip, Philip, Philip made it attractive. Philip was not badgering him or beating him down. Philip made it attractive. Paint a real picture of heaven and hell. Make sure that you emphasize eternal life. Make sure you emphasize eternal life in the presence of God. And God's presence is in heaven. Make sure you emphasize eternal life in God's presence, in the presence of of God and eternal separation in the absence of God which is hell tell me and women boys and girls that, that in the presence of God there's heaven heaven would not be heaven if God wasn't there heaven would not be heaven if God was not there the only reason heaven is heaven is because God is there. Look at your personal life. Look at what you go through. When you, you tell God, God, come over, come on in the room. Whenever, whenever God's in the room, heaven is there. Whenever God is, there's heaven. Where there is no God, there's hell. Wherever there is no God, there's hell. Eternal separation is the absence of God. That is hell. I'm not talking about the hell we see on earth. I'm talking about a real place set aside, and it's not an apartment either. It's a place called hell. Heaven is the better choice. Heaven is the better choice. Heaven's eternal beauty Heaven's eternal glory, heaven's eternal pleasure should utterly outweigh, utterly outweigh hell's gloom and doom. Always. Well, always outweigh hell's gloom and doom. In the presence of Jesus Christ, there is complete peace. In the presence of Jesus, there is complete peace. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. It is the absence of pain and suffering. In heaven, there is no pain and there is no suffering. It is a land where the inhabitants, Christians, it is a land where the inhabitants Christians never grow old. It is a mansion where there is fullness of joy in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus is the light of the world for all eternity. Jesus is the light of the world for all eternity. Who is? Jesus, Jesus is the light of the world for all eternity. Then you got hell. In the absence of God, there is torment, anguish, and eternal damnation. In the absence of God, there is torment, 
anguish and eternal damnation. Imagine being locked away in an asylum populated with insane people who are tortured, who are tormented rather, day in and day out by their own insanity, despair, and hopelessness. Guess what that is? That's hell. And the reason why it's hell is because we have a choice. We can choose either heaven or hell. The choice is ours. People always ask the question, will a, a great God, will a good God send somebody to hell? What's the answer? Will a good God send somebody to hell? He will allow you to go. He will allow you to go. The choice is ours. And, only, and it's so simple how you can miss hell. You is so simple, you can just make sure you miss hell by confessing Christ as your Savior and going to heaven. Because those in hell will be dealing with insanity, despair, and hopelessness. That's hell. Imagine wanting to commit suicide. Because you didn't find relief in this bottomless pit of darkness. And being unable to obtain any kind of relief. That's hell. Imagine being separated from God for all eternity. That's hell. At this point, I want to open up or open discussion. I want you to do your homework assignment of reading Matthew 26, 33, 36 through 46 for next week. But I want to open up for this little discussion. I want you to tell me what are the benefits of going to hell and what are the benefits of going to heaven? What are the benefits of going to hell? Because it has to have benefits because so many people want to go. You hear guys make statements like, oh, when, we, when I get to hell, my boys and I are going to get drunk down there. <laughs> when I go to hell, I'm telling you, my boys and I really going to party then. Yeah. When I go to hell, the boys and I are going to throw dominoes and cards all day and all night. So somebody help me with this. But will I, sis will I, sis will somebody tell me what are the benefits of going to hell? Come on to me. Ain't no benefits. No benefits? Going to hell. Y'all sure? Uh -huh. Why are people dying to go? They're foolish. Brother McGill, tell me the benefits. All the thing I can think of is a free ride. <laughs> it is a free ride. <laughs> you may not even ride in a limousine. Okay, everybody in here, tell me what are the benefits of going to heaven? Give me one each, one person. Eternal life. Eternal life. Anybody else? No pain and suffering. No pain and suffering. Anybody else? All 50 people in the room need to participate. You be with Jesus. Is there a benefit to be with Jesus? What's the benefit of being with Jesus? People say he's just a prophet. He's just a man like we are. He's our savior. He delivered us. He saved us. He, he washed us. He cleansed us. He's Jesus. We want to rejoice with him, don't we? Peace and contentment. Sister David that like she ain't getting no peace and contentment at home. She said she got to go to heaven to get it. I better straighten up my life. She said when she get to heaven, she, she going to have some peace and contentment. So the Richard said, Sister David going to have some quietness too. But what you don't realize is that I'm the quietest person in the house. I am the quietest person in the house. I guarantee you. Yes? <laughs> 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 
So when we when we when we go to heaven, the Bible paints this beautiful picture. And you know, John, John could only paint in the book of Revelation, John could only paint pictures for us of things that we know about. John paints a picture of golden streets. He paints a picture of 12 gates leading to the city. He paints a picture of, of fruit on the tree that's good for the healing of the nation. No pandemic in heaven. He paints this beautiful picture that we're going to be having church all day and all night. Because John, John really just telling us what we can see and understand. Then John paints a picture of 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. And then John says, oh, shucks, I can't. There's another number I can't even imagine. Even John, when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and God was speaking to him, even John said, there's some great things happening in heaven I can't even tell you about. The heart of Apostle Paul said, I hadn't seen, ear hadn't heard what good things that God has in store for those who walk uprightly before him. He could only paint a picture to the human mind of what the human mind could see and understand. But God got some things, God has some things in heaven that we can't even imagine. John just painted a picture of what we can understand because we've been around on earth for a while. But don't you want to go to heaven? Yeah. Ooh, Lord. I guarantee you, not one single loved one that you have lost who has gone to heaven won't come back here. I guarantee you. That's why the Apostle Paul says, don't you dare sorrow like some who have no hope. Because those who died in Christ, who believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, guess what's going to happen? What's going to happen is they're going to catch the flight before we do. Those who died in Christ, Jesus will bring with him. And at the trump of God, at the sound of the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we should not perceive those who already have died. Paul said, don't act like you got no hope. Because there is hope. And the hope is in heaven. And the only reason the hope is in heaven is because Jesus, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, are there. That's why we need to be born again. That's why we need to be saved. That's why we need to know Jesus. Because we want to live in peace. Sister David says she want to live in peace and contentment. You want to go tonight? Oh, okay. I just check it. I just check it. I just check it. I'm not. Teacher asked teacher ask, ask the class, how many of y'all want to go to heaven? Everybody raise their hand. But one little boy said, so, so, you know, we call him here back, Johnny. Johnny, why don't you, why don't you want to go to heaven? He said, I thought you had a bus out there right now. I ain't going to go right now. <laughs> if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is your moment to trust in Jesus. And all you have to do is just like Philip says to the unit, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You need Jesus. If you can just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose from the dead, you can be saved right here, right now. If you would bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life. Because I'm sure you don't want to go to hell. But I'm sure you want to go to heaven. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. 
I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that if you receive Jesus Christ through this prayer tonight, we believe that you're born again. And we believe that you're on your way to heaven and not hell. If you don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church in Southeast Houston. 4251 Shiremile Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. It is often time, it's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial giving. It is often time. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity you've given. We thank you for every gift. We thank you for jobs and income. We thank you for increase. We ask you to bless every giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. To all of us, we are looking forward to our Bible Bowl this Sunday. This Sunday is our Bible Bowl where we have an abbreviated form of our Sunday school lesson and then we have a great wholesome competition of lessons from the month of March all the way to the to the end. So we're looking forward to our, our Bible Bowl. We do this every fifth Sunday. It's about four fifth Sundays in the year. So our Bible Bowl tune in with us. It's from March 5th to April 16th where our questions are coming from. But those of you in the room, if you need your questions, I have some for you. Looking forward to the Bible Bowl on Sunday. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to, to do our Bible listening. We're looking forward to the, the second quarter where we're listening to what God has to say and we're journaling down what God is saying. Amen. So we're looking forward to uh, completing uh, the second quarter, which will go on until the end of June. Uh, so it's from March. March ends the first quarter, then April, May, and June will be the second quarter. We are still in the Old Testament. We're listening to what God has to say. Amen. And we're journaling what God says. Why don't we stand to be dismissed? We have a birthday party this coming uh, Sunday. A birthday party for those who are are born or were born rather in the month of March and in the month of April. So we're taking March and April and putting it together. We're going to have a birthday party right after service on this Sunday. Come and celebrate with us. We're looking forward to it. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege and honor to hear from you, Lord. We ask you to bless us, Father God, and keep us Bless us to be soul winners for Jesus Christ. Bless us to paint vivid pictures of what heaven looks like and vivid pictures of what hell looks like. Bless us, Lord, that we will always be about your business. And bless us that we will always look to lead people to Christ, that they will understand who Jesus is. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. 
Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.